أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Brothers, sisters, youngsters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have been granted another chance to meet up on this blessed night of Thursday, which is the Laylatul Qadr of the week. It's a time, it's a chance given to us by Allah. For, to ask for maghfira, to ask for dua. And of course, one of the best acts, or one of the best deeds on Laylatul Qadr is to gain knowledge. And that's why we are here. The topic, as it was announced, um, Iron Will, for those of you who might have Googled uh, Iron Will, I don't know what you came up with. I don't know if anyone did that. But Iron Will was a Hollywood movie, actually, released. That's what came up with one of our books. Yes. So it was a Hollywood movie released in 1994. And a beautiful movie. I watched it at a time when we just had our TV, uh, first TV in, in Arusha. And for the longest time, we didn't have a cable. So the only way I would watch a movie would be through video cassettes, which was very good because our parents had the chance to, had the choice and had control over the TV. So this was one of the movies um, that my dad, Marhum, may Allah bless his soul, inshallah, uh, allowed us to, to watch Iron Will. So it's about uh, this boy called Will Stoneman a 17-year-old uh, living on a farm somewhere in, uh, in the United States. And uh, his father was a carpenter and he was working with his father. And one fine day he gets a letter that he's been accepted into college. So now he's torn apart whether he should go to college or stay back a decision that most of us go through. But his father tells him that, no, my son, you've got a chance to study, go ahead. You should go and study and leave the farm. But just before he leaves, there's a small accident. Uh, it's not a small one. And they had those dog sleds. So those wild dogs pulled that sled, that wooden sled, that was the mode of transport uh, in those times, 1917. So this is based on a true story. So the father is behind, the son is in front with some wild dogs. And the father's sled falls into a river. And just to save his son's life, he cuts the rope and he drowns. So tragic accidents, the father dies. And now the son has to take care of his mother and the farm. So what happens now is the father was in debt. So the mother decides to sell the dogs, the wild dogs, to be able to pay back the debt. And that, this really disturbs the son because the son grew up with his dogs. And then the mother tells the son that your father had a dream of racing, there's a dog race, an annual dog race from uh, Winnipeg, which is in Canada, to St. Paul in Minneapolis. So 500 mile race in those times. So it's a dog race through the wilderness. So the mother tells the son that your father had this dream 
of participating in this dog race because the prize money is very good. And he wanted to win this race so that he can get this money and pay off the debt of the farm. So the son says, I'm going to race. No experience whatsoever. He just knew his dogs. So he starts training. And his training is done with a native Indian. A native Indian who was working on their farm. And he trains him for a whole month. So there's physical training, there's mental training, and there's spiritual training. And sometimes you, you wish that I wish these Red Indians were left where they were. They were not eliminated. The U.S. wouldn't have been in the state they are in today. The values that they had, the way they lived with nature. But anyways, he trains him and the son goes for the race. He's an underdog. People count him out. And uh, there's a news reporter, Harry Kingsley, who pays the penalty because he was late in, late in registering for the race. So this guy pays him. But he has an intention, the reporter, as all reporters do. They're looking for news, journalists. So he says, I'm going to sponsor this boy because I feel he's going to make headlines. So he pays the penalty and he's registered. And he starts the race. So what is remarkable about this, this story is the determination of this boy. Determination, the fighting spirit, and the training that he follows of the Indian master who had, he had, the Indian teacher, the native Indian teacher, who told him sleep less, ride for long times, work hard, start early in the morning, simple advices which he followed. And during the race, he's leading, and there's another competitor who falls sick. So he sacrifices his lead to help the other guy. The other guy had flu or influenza at that time. So sacrifice, caring, compassion, empathy. And he was given this title of Iron Will. Because his name was Will. But also Iron Will because of his willpower. And because this journalist was giving him good coverage. In those times, if you see the movie, it was Telegram. And they were falling on a train. So the dog race was going on through the wilderness, a very difficult terrain, 500 miles. And this man kept on reporting it. This boy is, is doing well. And at that time, 1917, there was another war going on. So people, everybody's attention was there. But then this boy diverted that attention. So for a few days, they started following the boy because of the coverage. So I don't want to spoil the fun for those of you who want to watch um, the movie. You should watch it. Iron Will, what happened to the race? How did it finish? But I borrowed the name. My intention was to borrow the name, but the story also. This determination that he had, this willpower that he had. Um, and I want you to keep it in your mind. If you had watched the movie, it would have stayed better in your mind. But just a summary of what this story is all about. And we'll talk about it uh, later on. The same year, 1994, another movie was released. Now, Samahani, it's, it's Thursday night, and you might be thinking that we've come to discuss movies here. So just one more movie, then we'll go ahead. So the same year, another movie was released called Shawshank Redemption. Some of you might have watched Shawshank Redemption. And it's about this prisoner who is sentenced to life imprisonment and he's accused of killing his wife and life imprisonment and his story in prison. And whatever happens there, I don't want to go into the details, but what was remarkable was 19 years, he started digging a hole or a tunnel through the prison walls. It took him 19 years to dig a hole from his prison wall. And one fine day, he just disappeared and he escaped into the sewage pool and out of there. 
So this is not based on a true story. This was just a novel that was made into a movie and he, he had his own dream and the person that he met in jail. So the theme here was the escape from the prison, the determination that this man had 19 years. You're digging the wall slowly, slowly and coming out of, of prison. So keeping these two stories um, together, what I really wanted to discuss and it's very much related to what is happening around the world just now for those of you who are following the news. So 6 September is a very important day for the Palestinians, um, the Palestinian history. And 6 September was marked in the calendar and it's going to be commemorated every year. Why? 6 September 2021 Six Palestinians escaped from the Gilboa or Gilboa uh, prison in occupied Palestine. So on the first year anniversary, Al Mayadeen channel, which is based in Beirut, uh, it gives a lot of coverage to the uh, Palestinian news or Palestinian happenings, happenings in the occupied lands. So on the first anniversary, they presented a six-part series on the detail, details of this escape. I don't know if any one of you has gone through that story, but it's spectacular. And even the way they got this story, one of the prisoners, the mastermind, of course, these prisoners were arrested after escaping, but after being in prison again, he smuggled out the story and he sent it to Al Mayadeen. Although there are so many people waiting to buy the story, but they gave it free of charge to Al Mayadeen to present it, a six part series. The reason being that Al Mayadeen has supported us and it means a lot to us Palestinians, so we'll give it to them. So the director himself presents this six part series. So something about, but this captive movement, what hap whatever happens in these Palestinian jails, is not a new concept, escaping and the happenings. This captive movement, they call it the captive movement, started 70 years back, right from the time the occupation started. And they've always made an effort. In fact, even before that, during the British rule, they were never happy with the happenings around them. Whenever they were jailed, they always made an effort to do something to gain their freedom, their independence. So the whole story is related by Mahmoud Al-Arida, who was the mastermind of this whole uh, escape. But before that, just a little bit about the prison itself. Jilboa prison is not a normal prison. It's the third most secure prison in the world. And the most secure prison in occupied Palestine. So it's around six kilometers from the West Bank. They call it the iron safe. Just the safe that we have to keep our money. So this prison is called the iron safe. And that's why you need the iron will to escape from there. So the iron safe, it has been fortified using research. So they have studied prisons around the world and they have studied escapes around the world. And accordingly, they have designed this prison. So thick walls, even the floor, there is steel and then there is concrete on top of it and then there are tiles. Not only that, but knocking on the walls or on the floor, they have electric sensors. So if there's any knocking activity going on, either on the walls or the floor of the prison, it's detected by the computers. They have watchtowers in small distances around the prison and dogs. So security is top notch in this prison. And the search is three times a day. 
In this prison, every prisoner is searched three times a day. They go in and check. And the prisoners are called out, not only with their names, but photographs. So nobody else can call on the other's behalf. Not only that, but they rotate prisoners. So they don't keep them in one cell. They keep rotating them around. So nobody is comfortable with the environment that they have. So the place where this escape took place was cell number five in section two of the prison. Cell number five, section two of the prison. And very interestingly, they gave this room a name. The prisoners themselves gave this room a name. Do you know what name was given? The room was called General Qasim Suleimani Room. So they gave it the name General Qasim Suleimani Room. Just to show their relationship with this man. As to what status did he have, what relationship or how much they existed in the thoughts of this man and how much he did for them. So in respect of uh, Haji Qasim, they call this room Haji Qasim Suleimani. So who are the six prisoners? It's worth seeing their, their biographies or their identities. I don't know if it's right to use the word biography, he's still alive, but anyways. So Mahmoud al Arida the mastermind of this whole and by the way they were all sentenced to life so they were all in prison for life several life sentences all six of them so he was the founder mem member of al quds uh, brigades and he tried to escape from prison many times before so he is a known person for escaping and just as a challenge, the Israelis told him, so you have a habit of escaping. We'll put you in this prison. Let's see what you can do. And they do that for people who are very naughty and they don't have discipline. They're sent to Gilboa or Gilboa prison. So it was like a challenge that if you have a habit of escaping, try escaping from here, from the iron safe. The second one was Zakaria Zubaydi, who was a late addition to the group. He's also a commander. And in his family, right from 1988, someone or the other has been in prison. So they've never had a family reunion since 1988. Somebody or the other has been in prison. So Zakaria Zubaydi was one of them. Ayham Kamamji was the third one. This guy is very interesting. He is a Friday prayer Imam. So Imam, imam of Juma and used to give sermons. He had two bachelor degrees from Al-Quds University in Gaza and a master's degree from University of Cairo. So highly educated person. And in prison, he had uh, taken up this task of educating the fellow prisoners. So he would do this while in prison. And he would help the other prisoners to read and write. And they say he was very good hearted. Very kind hearted. So anybody who had problems, they would go to him. Then Munad al Nafiat, again, a prisoner, and his family paid the price. So just to discipline him, members of his family were also put in prison. He was the fourth one. Yaqub Qadri, he was one of the first people to be contacted by Mahmoud al Aridam. And Muhammad al Aridam, was the sixth one, the younger brother of Mahmoud. And then there were some additional helpers who did not escape because they were not on a life imprisonment, but they helped in digging of this tunnel. So there are many, but I just thought of mentioning this guy here, Muhammad Shreem. Muhammad Shreem. He was going to be released in the same month as they started digging the tunnel. He had finished his term and he was going to be released in the same month. And when he found out that they're digging the tunnel, he said, I will help you. 
and when he was caught and when this whole thing failed, not failed, when they were arrested and they found out that he participated, he was given four more years of imprisonment. But he sacrificed his freedom to help in this cause. He did not escape, but he helped in the digging. And Mahmoud al Arida says he was the main laborer when it came to digging uh, the tunnel. The other thing was secrecy. Amazing. So they were going through all this digging of this tunnel. But other than the six and a few helpers, none of the other inmates knew about it. So the circumstances in which it was done, people just thought that they're digging a hole just to hide their mobile phones, the smuggled mobile phones into prison. So they're looking for a place to hide it. So while all this was going on, nobody else knew about it except this group itself. So do you want to know when was this plan designed or when did it cross Mahmoud al Arida's mind? They say it is as old as Jilbo itself. So he started thinking about escaping right from 2003. He escaped in 2021, but he thought of the escape right from the 2003. At that time, he was in Shatta prison, another prison. And he would keep on asking Jilboa, inmates from Jilboa, that what is that prison like? Give me some more details. And he was drawing a mental map. And after talking to them, he found out a weak point. So he said, I want to go there. So he started filling up papers to get a transfer. 2005, he was transferred to Gilboa, Gilboa prison. That's where he went and studied the ground plan as to how it has been designed. 2014, they started digging and he was arrested. The plan failed, so they were put in solitary confinement and sent from, to another prison. 2017, he was back in Jilboa, just as a challenge that you can't do anything. December 14, 2020, he was in cell number 14. And he had decided to escape from there, but suddenly he was transferred to cell number 5. And that's where he, he started. So he says the secret of success of this project or this escape was his team. He says he personally trained each and every one of them right from 2015. So he says his team was good and that's why they were successful in, in escaping. And they started digging, now it has become a symbol now, the spoon. So simple tools like the spoon. They started digging the tunnel and they came to a steel plate and they started cutting it. I don't know how they cut it. March 2021, so three months after they started digging, there was a surprise check and they couldn't detect it. It was very close to being detected and somehow they missed it. April of 2021, while they were digging the tunnel, one of the members while digging got stuck in that hole and he nearly lost his life. So they had to go around and rescue him. These prisoners had to go and so all these happenings and there's so many more details which I have left out. And then finally, one guard comes in, I think it was September 4th or 5th, a day before they escaped. He came in and saw that there was a hole and the prisoners thought, okay, now we are going to be caught. So they were deciding, they had planned to escape on the 7th of September, but instead, 5th September, the same night, they came out from the prison. So it was successful. They came out, and I think it was past midnight that they came out of the prison. And if you go to the Al Mayadeen website, they described the feeling of freedom, the smell of the soil and the things that they missed out, the coffee, Palestinian coffee, and the fruits and the olives. 
and how they tried to run. Plan A did not work out, so they had to separate in twos. So three groups of two each. After five days, Mahmoud Arida and Yaqub, who were partners, were caught. Even that, they say accidentally. They were stopped by traffic police and they were arrested. Zakaria Zubaidi and Muhammad Arida were arrested later on while they were looking for food in one of the houses. But the last two, Ayham Kamamji, the Imam, the Friday Imam, and Munad al Nafiyat, they made it to Janine. That was their plan, to make it to Janine. And Janine is the center of resistance. They really talk about Janine. They are all from Janine. So they all made it. So these two made it to Janine. They were nearly caught, they separated, and then they made up in Janine. And they were given shelter and protected by the brigades. But what happened then was when the Israelis found out that these two are in Janine, they threatened that we know which house they're living in, and we're going to bring down this house, and we're going to attack Janine just to get these two prisoners. So these two thought, you know, this is not right. And in the meantime, there was a threat from the Hamas in Gaza that if you do anything to these prisoners, we are going to attack. So these prisoners, two guys are discussing amongst themselves that just for us, so many people are going to lose their life and there's going to be bloodshed. And we are not doing this for personal reasons. We are doing it for Palestine. So they allowed themselves to be arrested. They gave themselves up. And it was so embarrassing for the Israelis. People were fired from their jobs and they tried to cover it up. But the story was just too big. So that's why it leaked out. But they say okay, all the prisoners were given up by the Israeli with the Arab Israelis. So it is the Arabs who gave them, who informed the Israelis that these prisoners are, are around. A tip off. But the prisoners themselves say no. Wherever we went, the hospitality was excellent. They protected us. It was just accidentally that we were arrested and circumstances were such that we had to give ourselves up. But what mattered here was the determination. Right from the time the plan came into this person's mind, how many failed attempts, and finally they escaped. And even after escaping, giving up that sense of freedom, because they had already done the damage to the enemy. So this is one story, a remarkable story, and it's movie stuff. And a movie is going to be made sometime in the future, and books are going to be written. But the damage that it has caused, the morale boost that it has given to other prisoners, now you'll hear of many prisoners going on hunger strike. They're going on strike, they don't want to stand trial. So Khalil Awawde, um, the 40-year-old, father of four, who went on a 180-day hunger strike. 180 days without food, just having water. Nearly died in hospital. And he only stopped his hunger strike after the negotiating with the Israelis for him to be released. So people have become very bold now. It has given them this courage that no, this uh, the Israelis were invincible, undefeatable. But what has happened now is it has dented the credibility of, of these people. And they, Uday Tamimi, a few weeks back, Uday Tamimi, very interesting, in Shuafat refugee camp, he came out and he shot a soldier, killed a soldier, and he managed to get away. And when the information went out that we're looking for this person, by the name of Uday Tamimi profile, he's bold. So immediately, three people went to the barber 
and shaved their head and a TikTok video was sent out. And the whole refugee camp, all the men shaved their heads just to make it difficult for this man to be traced. And one would expect that he would have gone into hiding now that he had escaped. So they surrounded the refugee camp and what would think that he would remain in hiding. Ten days after that, he comes out again and does another shooting and he was killed. But he's become an icon. So we will see a lot of these stories um, coming up and we can discuss the current affairs when we are discussing this after the, the lecture. So this is the iron will that I wanted to talk about. The willpower of these people, the fighting spirit not to give up 70 years and slowly we are seeing the fruits and it gives everybody hope that one day these people are going to live free inshallah and we have to talk about them they need our duas we need to follow the news and see what are they doing and we'll discuss why in the discussion time after the, the lecture but just a spiritual aspect to this so they are not the only ones who have escaped they are not the only ones who are fighting a war the Iran-Iraq war, the shuhada that we had they were shaheeds of a different level so Ali Chitsazian shaheed, I've mentioned his this sentence again and again he says, you will not be able to go through the barbed wire of the enemy until you've gone through the barbed wire of your soul. He was telling his, his soldiers under him, he was a commander, and he's telling his soldiers, can you see the barbed wire of the enemy you want to go through? You won't be able to go through the barbed wire of the enemy unless you go through the barbed wire of your soul. Meaning that to be able to have willpower in you, spiritual elevation, spiritual cleansing is very important. And the shuhadas, there are so many biographies that are there out. Just see their characters, rather than what they did on the battlefield, but just look at their characters, how purified they were, how they went through the barbed wires of their souls before they could liberate the territories that, territories that, that were taken over by the, by the enemy. So at this point, there's a nice hadith from Imam Hussain uh, alayhi salam on the day of Ashura. Allahumma oh. salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. Whereby he tells the enemies that even if you don't have a religion, at least be free in your present life. At least be free. He's not talking about the physical freedom, but spiritually elevating yourself to be free of attachments of this world so that you can soar spiritually. That's what Ali Chitsazian was talking about. So the battle starts within and then it goes out. So the feats that we hear, yes, they may seem great, but we should also understand that it's something that starts within them. There's a journey that they go within them before they can do great things from outside. A couple of Quranic verses which gives us a lot of hope so surah hash chapter 59 verse number two so both these verses that i'm going to recite is a common phrase that allah has used so i'm not going to read the whole verse but in this verse allah says a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim wa dhannu annahum ma ni'atuhum husunuhum min allah فَأَتَاهُمْ اللَّهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَمْ يَحْتَسِبْ وَقَضَفَ فِي قُلُوبِهِ مِنْ رُعْبِ So he says, while they were certain that their fortresses would defend them against Allah, but Allah came to them where they did not expect. Allah came to them from where they did not expect. مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ and he cast terror in their hearts. If you see the occupied territories today, they've walled the whole area. So Gaza, 
West Bank, concrete walls, Jilboa prison, big wall, thinking that this is the iron safe. But Allah says, we are going to strengthen these people and we are going to cast fear into the enemies and they're going to be confronted from areas where they never expected. In Haithu, la yahtasib. And there's another one which addresses the mu'mineen or the believers. So Surah Talaq, verse number two. Again, I'm just going to read a part of the verse. This is a verse that we are told. It's recommended to recite this verse after every salah, if possible. Along with Ayatul Kursi and Tasbih. This strengthens you. And the next verse. The same phrase. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ وَأَمْرِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا So whoever is careful of his duty to Allah وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا He will make an outlet for him Taqwa Whenever we are stuck in life We don't all have to go to Jilboa prison We all have our own prisons Be it business Problems Obstacles in life God says if you have taqwa We will give you a way out so we can use this prison story as a lesson to apply in our lives. So Allah will make an outlet and give them sustenance from where he thinks not. Your risk will come from places where you never thought. Risk is not only money. Willpower is risk. Security is risk. Health is risk. And whoever trusts in Allah, He is sufficient for him. Surely Allah attains His purpose. Whatever Allah plans, He will always fulfill it. And Allah indeed has appointed a measure for everything. So one hadith from Hussein alayhi salam, these two verses, which would give us hope when we are reading the Holy Quran, Surah Hashr, whenever you're feeling down, when there's a lot of dhulm happening in the world, just open the Quran and read Surah Hashr. Just the first few verses, it gives you so much hope that no, Allah will help us. And Surah Talaq, this verse, and this story speaks for itself. The escape and the tussle that these people are going through, they need our du'as. But at the same time, it's a lesson for us to apply in our lives, difficult times are coming. Everybody has told us it's not going to be easy, there's going to be an imtihan, the way the world is going, restrictions for the Shias. We need to tighten our belts, increase our faith in Allah, have taqwa. And it's only through stories like this that we need to fortify ourselves. It doesn't happen after, so we have time to prepare. Maybe if you wait until it's happened, if you become reactive, it might be very difficult. So this is the time to fortify uh, ourselves, uh, inshallah. So I'll stop here, and inshallah, um, we can have a uh, discussion after the few points that I wanted to discuss. After that, inshallah, we'll discuss it uh, uh, later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.